uh, we'll get started for this webinar today. And uh, we're finally at part five of the masterclass series. So welcome, one and all. It's really nice to have all of you all here. Uh, as we've said before, the masterclass is certified. And this means that if you attend all five sessions, you can take an assessment and then earn the ESG uh, masterclass certificate. Now, please stay with us until the end. We have more details on how you can take the assessment and earn the certificate. Uh, the webinar is hosted by Benchmark Digital, as we've said before. So for over two decades now, Benchmark Digital's cloud-based digital EHS and ESG platform has helped businesses manage safe and sustainable operations worldwide and digitally transform their environmental, health, safety, sustainability, quality, ESG, and supplier and product stewardship programs. And that brings us to part five today. It's wonderful to see uh, the vision that we've had come to fruition at part five today. Now, a series that we put together to help our community of business leaders understand ESG better. And until today, uh, we've looked at the E, which was the environment, the S, the social, G, governance, as well as decoded investment grade ESG data and the power of digital. And today we're wrapping up the series by exploring how you can get ESG reporting right, the frameworks under which you can report, and of course the rating agencies and how they assess your performance. Okay, um, now here's our ESG Masterclass team. And uh, so we've heard the introductions many times before, but uh, I have to tell you their expertise is at the heart of this series. So quick introductions again here. Now we have with us Mr. Shankar Rajagopalan. He is an ESG expert as well as a masterclass lead. Uh, Shankar is an environment, health, safety, quality, sustainability expert with more than 36 years of experience. He is currently an ESG consultant who has extensive experience working as previous ESG head at Grand Hills India Limited, uh, as uh, well as in sustainability and ESG roles at Dr. Reddy's Pfizer. Tata Project and Sterling and Wilson. Um, Shankar, as always, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be on board. Yeah. And we also have our digital ESG experts. So we have Chandan Tiwari. He is currently the Associate Director of APAC Subscriber Development He at Benchmark Digital. He is a qualified EHS practitioner with 13 years of experience in digital transformation, business integration, ESG, sustainability, occupational health, safety, and environment management system implementation. Uh, we also have Ayush Vidyadharan here with us. Ayush is manager, subscriber development and engagement at Benchmark Digital. He is a mechanical engineer by profession and holds a master's in EHS with experience working with ports and logistics and manufacturing firms prior to joining Benchmark. Ayush is today a GRI trained sustainability professional with expertise in GRI, GHE, the GHE protocol and DRSR. And as you'll see, as we go ahead today. Uh, now Benchmark is also hosting this webinar in collaboration with Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce. Here's a brief look at all the parts uh, we've covered so far. It's been quite a journey. And uh, we're finally here today at ESG reporting. We look at the strategies, the frameworks, as well as uh, digital transformation. Uh, now, a quick note again, you've uh, been here before. So we really, we're really excited to hear all your questions and thoughts. And we've had a flood of them come at us in the past as well. Uh, so please go ahead, add in anything you may have in the chat box and uh, our experts will answer them in the question and answer session at the end. Yeah. Uh, so Shankar, uh, you can go ahead. I will wonderful. just talk. Wonderful. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. This is uh, a welcome to the next season. It's been uh, interesting. It's been a nice journey there, right? It's been something that we've... Uh, taken across all seasons. There's a good morning from Pramod Pisal and IST, but I guess you've got a global audience out here. So welcome back to the season five, the fitting finale, where we try and address and summarize, recap all of what we did. So today's agenda, folks, is uh, we begin with a recap of what we did in the earlier session, 
uh, decoding investment grade ESG data, and we'll try and demystify that further in this session. Uh, we'll look at the reporting in the APAC from the audience on the call. This is the most relevant zone. Uh, we'll look at strategy, how exactly to build your ESG program, what do you do, where do you start across various levels of maturity that your organization might be, and various framework expectations. Where do you need to start? Where do you start and where do you finish and what do you do? And then what do you choose? Which framework to go by? There's so many, and we spoke about some of them across the last four sessions. We've given you a teaser as an intro to each of these platforms. So what do you choose? And then who decides what you do? Like I said, the ratings and the rankings, do they judge you on your performance and your maturity? How do they go about getting the data? And of course, this is the theme of the session, digitally transforming ESG program. And that's what we'll try to talk about. So that's the overall flavor of what we'll do in this session. And uh, a recap on what we did last time, uh, we looked at uh, demystifying the G, the governance, which we said is the ultimate bottom line. It all begins with the total commitment from the top. The tone at the top is what drives organizations. And therefore, it's no surprise that governance is the key uh, element here. Governance drives the uh, policies, uh, the strategy, the operation, the mission, mission values is all driven by governance. Uh, it also talks about largely the ethics, compliance, data privacy policies, uh, the board diversity, of course, gets back to the board, board independence, inclusion, and that's where it's uh, always good to begin at the top here. How we effectively manage risks and reputation, especially ESG and the SEBI in India, and the LRR has stated expectations on managing enterprise risk, specifically on ESG risk here. You know that the entire uh, journey of sustainability and ESG began with the investment community, and we're looking at investment grade data, and what exactly do they look at is what we'll try and talk about more today. And of course, end with digital tools on how you can ease your governance reporting across the journey there. So the pillars of governance, as you see out here, uh, these are the pillars that we spoke about. Uh, and the top one is the one that it begins with, the ethics, business practices, and of course, uh, ending up with executive performance, ESG governance, risk management, and stakeholder engagement and rights also is part of the governance framework there. So that is a blast from the blast from last, last month of February. So we also discussed, uh, you know, when you talk of ESG reporting, uh, we know that the reporting practices are evolving. There are many uh, businesses, it's due to some businesses, uh, the principles that uh, are generally accepted, they come from the financial accounting and reporting principles, as you said, and they also reflect the outcome of collaborative processes, including uh, involving engaging stakeholders in a wide range of technical, environmental and accounting disciplines there. Uh, the typical accounting platforms uh, need various, uh, you know, the principles, the platforms are relevance, completeness, consistency, transparency, accuracy. And that's how the relevance of the ESG uh, reports comes through here. While Benchmark Digital also did a survey last year, uh, and the ESG survey spoke about investor attitudes on the company ESG data. What do investors define on the investment data, the importance of the data out here? The outcomes of these, what you see out here, they need to be timely and relevant, accurate and transparent, and they need to be auditable and verifiable. And that's coming up very clearly across here. The data needs to be uh, you know, verifiable and they need to be complete and consistent, which goes with the comprehensiveness of data that you normally look at here. Uh, so consistency, transparency, accuracy, all that are the expectations of investment grade data. With that as the, as the ask, how do we then progress? How do we look at what we do out here? So let's take a quick look at the ESG reporting in the APAC region. So this is where it all kind of comes together, the green taxonomy, uh, what India has proposed, what's coming up to Malaysia, what's up in Japan. Uh, so Malaysia's India will come to in a bit, uh, where uh, the India's green transition since uh, the last conference of parties where we took a target of uh, net carbon neutral by 2070 has come in. Malaysia's incidentally provides a framework that facilitates robust and consistent assessments of economic activities and the impacts on the climate and the broader environment. When it comes to Japan, the Japanese government has published the basic guidelines on climate transition finance uh, as of a uh, couple of years ago. And the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, that's the MITI, is supporting the transition uh, finance by formulating sector roadmaps uh, for hard to abate industries. In last seasons, we gave an example of each of the uh, ESNG with an example of an industry. So this is where Japan is focused on all of that here. So going forward, Japan has also published the basic guidelines on climate transition finance, uh, where 
they try to promote investment in the low carbon transition thereby supporting the goal to become a carbon neutral society by 2050 there so they are ahead of uh, india of course so the guidelines intend to promote the spread of climate transition financing and increase its credibility overall there are various mandatory disclosures india will speak a little bit more about the brsr the business responsibility and sustainable reporting korea for example south korea has the listed companies on the cosp that is the korea composite stock price index which is a stock price index for all common stocks related uh, which is traded on the korean stock exchange and uh, you know normally uh, we talk of the various countries they've spoken about japan singapore has got this uh, sgx singapore exchange which has issued a common set of core energy metrics to be adhered to the market and more so investors look for credible esg data it comes in from disclosures of you know the target companies that we look at here that they would like to invest in the traditional disclosures like the annual finance report uh, or even a esg report based on perhaps the gri uh, the sustained reports do not uh, sufficiently carry these material disclosures uh, to aid such analytics. So typically, uh, the investors look at various other uh, information sources like the CDP, SASB, the TCFD, and of course, disclosures from the financial and the sustained reports. Now, there are various rating agencies, which we'll talk about more in this session, uh, and those are the ones that would rate and rank companies based on ESG, and the investors on many occasions try and look at uh, source the information from some of these. So that is the context. Uh, let's look at the ESG reporting strategy for us, wherever we are in our maturity on ESG practice. Like we explained in the last session here, you, you could be at the minimum practice where you are ticking in the box, starting with the compliance. There is a mandate and therefore you meet the mandate by do some risk mitigation and do some no harm measures in a little bit of uh, status of reacting rather than uh, being proactive here. You could address the external vulnerabilities and you look at stuff you do here, switching to the common practice where you look at efforts mostly outside the core business going beyond, no, not just looking inside out, but looking outside in, try and track major industry trends, look at the mega trends, the forces that's happening, using strengths to leverage uh, value across ESG goals, do the comply, do the comply uh, compliance with even the voluntary standards, not just wait for the mandatory and create a comprehensive sustainability policy here and run high level programs and even the sustainability or the CSR efforts would be not just philanthropic, but also look at how it's connected to the business. Obviously, this means a lot of engagement with the stakeholders, which is what's the next level practice getting into to leverage sustainability to the larger uh, form here, to leverage the super pass to move to industry sector standards to view ESG as a differentiator, to link this with the strategy of organization. So this is what happens when you really look beyond. This is a next level of practice here. So friends, we discussed about disclosures and where you start with. Regardless of where you start your journey from and when you do a baselining, uh, this is what you understand. How do you go across this? What are the steps you do? How do you progress on this? So let's look at how a typical journey for, and this is something that is relevant for a company that's been reporting on ESG for some years, or even one that's about starting here. So what's the expectation? Okay, what do you start? So on the x-axis is timelines, phase one and phase two. You could take each of these as a month. On the y-axis, of course, are the activities that you're planning. You'll always begin with a current state assessment and a gap analysis. Look at where you are. If you don't know where you are, you don't know where you would be going. Build in the capacity, the capability within the organization to understand ESG. Like they say, everyone, the ESG is something that, you know, like the three blind men look at the elephant. Everyone is right, but everyone is looking at it differently and they're not wrong. So that's why it's important to build the capability and capacity because people should connect with ESG. We also explained in the couple of earlier seasons about how ESG is more a tool for decision making. You look at the... Uh, Financial, you look at how you make a decision that is viable uh, with a return on investment, looking at the risk here. You also want to look at it from the social angle to look at the decision without impacting the people in the community, a decision that is equitable. And then also look at the operational front when you look at a decision that is bearable by looking at the material intensity, carbon, water, waste, and the supply chain there. When you look at that, you've got to build the organization together, build in a cross functional team, get in the stakeholder engagement, look at materiality. Look at what the material issues and lastly for organization, regardless of the sector in industry, it could be carbon, water, and waste. How would look at actions towards that brainstorm within, try and do the quick wins and take the next steps towards reduction of the footprints there. Uh, also initiate supply chain sustainably, looking beyond, look at the partners, look at the value chain there. 
getting data for both perhaps ESG and if it's an Indian company, look at the PRSR and publish a report there. So it will be the first steps for any company, regardless of which state of maturity you are in. And progressively, the potential next steps across the next year would be looking at disclosures like the CDP, uh, participating in awards, getting a feel of the peers, understanding the TCFD disclosures, set science-based targets, look at integrated reporting, a uh, one report, and then try to get into the rating with whatever the options you are. We'll talk a little bit more about that and product stewardship as appropriate here. There are some initiatives that would cover, uh, that would be done every year, like stakeholder engagement, the materiality mapping is refreshed every year. Likewise, the reduction of carbon, water, waste in the footprints, uh, CSR, HR initiative, people initiatives will continue year on year. So this is a typical roadmap for a company that gives our audience an idea of how you would progress in the steps of an ESG journey, an indicative roadmap with some milestones and timelines there. What would be the goals? What are indicative milestones, folks? And this is just uh, some of the illustrative uh, sustainability indicators. Uh, this could be, you know, it could take up a, and this is each country when it has its targets. We spoke about Japan 2050, India 2070. Uh, all corporates also therefore have a cascading target. Each state, each country, each, uh, you know, industry has a target there. This could come from the group, could, could come from the governing, governance. So this is how the targets come in. Could be carbon neutrality, water neutrality, waste neutrality, uh, social capital improvement uh, year on year, being an employer of choice but a particular year, sustainable supply chain, how you'd like to scope. Maybe start with the key uh, critical suppliers, try and engage all of them in uh, supply in, in ESG journey and take a target across scoping uh, 50%, 70%, 80%, and then 100% across time, take targets thereof. So these are some of the sustainability indicators, roadmaps, and so the goals you could set thereof from the targets that you might be, might brainstorm in, internally. So what the reporting process folks, this is again, uh, something that would be relevant for all of us. And in the couple of questions we had in the last sessions, the steps would, what are the most important cross-functional engagement platforms here? the one overarching approach that gets everyone involved. So you want everyone on the sustainability bus, you want all the sustainability teams. It begins with forming an organization, a sustainability organization, having sponsors, having champions across each function, everyone's involved, regardless of the function, uh, be it a technical services, be it operations, be it HR, be it finance, uh, be it supply chain, we need every one of them involved in that. So get them in across the business and develop in, and start with capacity building to demystify as we've been doing the masterclass series, what is ESG? Identify the key stakeholder groups as part of the workshops, as part of the sessions, try and brainstorm through various uh, tools. You could use multi-voting, you could use surveys, engage them on sustainability, conduct these workshops and try and understand, engage with them, including the value chain here. Conducting an ESG assessment, and this is what's the starting point like we spoke on a journey on the roadmap. How do you identify the key issues? How do you prioritize them? Play this back with the top management, uh, connect it and integrate it with the sustainable vision and strategy there. Identify the key issues through the top management view, looking inside out and looking outside in through the stakeholders. And of course, clearly do some benchmarking, try to see what the peers are doing, do some sectoral benchmarking and also try and find something else that uh, will tell you and decide what you need to do. And therefore, an outcome of these, as we uh, explained in the last couple of seasons, is identify the materiality, what's important for you, and also what's critical on impact to the stakeholders there. This could be the sustainability risks and opportunities and concerns. Try and play it back in a blueprint where you look at actions that you do, something goes back to the roadmap, and build in materiality analysis and build in the highlights there. Take in the key performance indicators, conduct the data collection. This is where uh, the hard uh, work comes in. Do the data analysis, finalize the reports, look at the trends. Uh, most of the reporting platforms require you to publish uh, at least a couple of years, if not more of data, and then start drafting the report in whichever platform you're reporting in. And of course, take across assurance. A lot of the expectations on assurance we will discuss in the next few uh, session, in the next few minutes. But overall, this is how you would communicate. The power of disclosure happens when you engage the entire cross-functionality of not just the organization business, but entire value chain out here. So th these friends are some of the steps. I hope these help you in understanding what are the key steps to report ESG and to progress, even if you don't intend to publish an external report, this is how you do the steps here. I hope this helps. To help you further, uh, we try to uh, explain how you do these at each step, how you do begin with the top, 
due to capacity building, you do desk-based reviews, you could do it online, you could do it in a physical interface there, how you do the reality assessment, understand the stakeholders, do the mapping after the engagement. And then of course, the critical part is data collection and the data collection mechanism, a data that is collated at the end of this year, it's too late to do much about it, right? So you can't react, you can't even do much about it. So that's the important reason why the data needs to be as real time as possible before you actually draft a report, which is why in this session, we'll talk a little bit about digital. The session's theme is about strategy framework, the digital transformation, and digital is veritably the driving force across each stage of ESG implementation there. Let's look at a small video uh, from a 25 year old platform called Jurai, the how of ESG, a five simple steps of reporting ESG. I hope you can listen to the sound and enjoy. How do I start reporting? GRI recommends a five step process. Prepare. Consider what your sustainability report might contain. What are your organization's major impacts? Develop an action plan and hold a kickoff meeting. Connect. Identify your key stakeholders and talk to them. The aim is to find out what your key stakeholders consider to be the most important sustainability topics that your organization should manage and report on. Define. Based on your stakeholder engagement, conduct an internal assessment with management. This will indicate the topics for your report that are most important, both internally and externally. Consider your organization's scope of influence, capacity, and commitments. This helps to decide how your organization's activities will be covered in the report. Monitor. Check processes and systems. Monitor activities and record data, ensuring the quality of information. Set performance goals and follow up. Report. Write your report and communicate it. When you have completed the five steps, your organization will have the resources in place to keep monitoring its performance so you can constantly manage your sustainability impacts and report your sustainability progress. Sustainability reporting is a key tool for the successful company of tomorrow. So that's How the, do I... So that's on the GRI, uh, which is the most popular platform on sustainability reporting. I hope that gives you a context to how you begin the journey, what the actual steps and addresses some of the questions you always asked here. Right, folks. So what's the right framework? How do you report? What is the platform you choose? A lot of people ask this question. There's a lot of changes that's happening there. So choosing the right framework is also so very critical. So again, what's your location? Wherever you're from, there are various frameworks there. You have the GRI, you have the Global Compact, the CDP, the Internet Reporting, and of course you have the uh, various things called the BRSR as I spoke about. Uh, we gave you a couple of indicators in the roadmap there as suggestions in how you would start and where you would progress to. So this is where uh, the relevance comes through of your location. The Business Responsibility System Reporting, the BRSR in India is most relevant. The Abu Dhabi Stock Exchange guidelines in the UAE, and of course, you, the EU companies need CSRD requirements there. US needs to consider the SEC climate disclosure requirements. So depending on the industry, whatever the sector you are in, be it financial, manufacturing, oil and energy, R&D, et cetera, the material factors would really help you define the basic framework. What works best is what is logical, the best fit there. So therefore, it is not about one answer that fits all. It's about identifying the materiality and therefore finding the relevant framework there. Therefore, it's important to begin with understanding yourself, who are the key stakeholders, and that's some of what you need to look at here. So this is where you basically start understanding the appropriate ESG framework there. So the BRSR, and uh, you know that this is so uh, something that we spoke about here. The uh, SEBI in its wisdom has uh, also begun this expectation for the last financial year where they made it voluntary with effect from the financial year 22-23, uh, they made financial uh, reporting through the BRSR mandatory. It's part of the annual report for the top 1,000 listed companies. And this disclosure that's required on the NGRBC, NGR, and the, the National Guidelines on Responsible Business Conduct. And this is across the framework that we've spoken about. Section A uh, is the uh, general disclosures. Uh, B is the management and process disclosures. 
And section C is the principle wise financial disclosures. Uh, these are the frameworks that you look at here. What you see in the bottom is the stakeholder engagement mechanism, materiality, and how it works on risk and opportunity. You can see it covers scopes. Most of what we spoke about looks at the ESG performance commitment. It has two, the essential indicators, and that is mandatory, and the leadership indicator that is voluntary, that looks at qualitative and quantitative disclosures. Of late, uh, the, ESG, the SEBI also wants uh, the BRSR assurance. There's been interestingly a backtesting of uh, voluntary reports uh, by eight on eight companies by some audit firms uh, that makes this most interesting. So the framework of the nine pillars uh, for the national guidelines for response to business conduct are these. Uh, we've spoken about this in the past, but this is what it talks about. It begins uh, with business conducting themselves ethics, transparency, accountability, goes on to the well-being of people, and they're off here. And you know that it is has a great connect with all the other platforms. In one of the last sessions, uh, we showed you how you can interconnect and we report on one platform, how you can use the BRSR to connect with them and uh, there's the interoperability between the frameworks there. And with each of what we spoke about, with the GRI, they received the SASB. And this helps companies uh, to report under global frameworks as well as report in the uh, BRSR without duplicating the efforts there. So the BRSR is designed to be a single comprehensive source of non-financial information for all the stakeholders. And there's a business advantage that it has. It increases the value creation. And of course, it helps in various ways in transparency and disclosures. And that's the way to go in the Indian uh, milieu note here. There's also, folks, as you're aware, the BRSR light. That is a pared-down version. And it's not just for the top 1,000 listed companies. There is a BRSR light that's come up which also encourages the first time efforts of various companies uh, to develop a sustainable report. It's a framework that helps companies uh, get information and be able to provide them and enables the small companies also to get into the uh, bandwagon of ESG reporting there. So that's the other thing that's happened, the change and the transformation across the Indian sector, a real game-changing act by the uh, SEBI that makes the Indian, uh, the Corporation the of Corporate Affairs has mandated this from this year, but some of them slowly are sinking in. As we speak, there is a consultation paper that's come up, new development, just to keep the audience uh, updated on what's happening there. The aim is to introduce parameters relevant to the Indian context and uh, the domestic disclosures on ESG. Uh, they include some things like job creation in the smaller cities. You know, each of the cities, each of the states also has an alignment to the SDGs. How we look at the gross wages paid, paid to the women by company, look at gender equality, look at diversity inclusion. The consultation paper also expects, like I mentioned, a reasonable assurance on the BRSR core KPIs. This is indicated to be uh, hopefully uh, in the going forward mandatory for the top 500 in 2024-25 and thereupon to the next in 2025-26, the top 1,000 companies there. So that's coming up, folks, and that's why it's important for us to be aware of uh, the uh, regulatory landscape there. There's also the uh, regulation of ESG rating providers uh, to have a unique set of uh, metrics to assign ESG scores for listed companies like you mentioned, there's any rating agency which could pick up data from the public domain and you'd find yourself rated there without your even having disclosed formally there. And that's why I think this is so critical there. The BRSR core uh, is for the smaller firms that have a limited access, limited set of disclosures there to provide uh, credibility and reduce the cost of compliance there. So this is what's happening on the SEBI's front on India. The Indian BRSR has a lot of, uh, this year has been the year of the, uh, of the BRSR. The business responsibility sustainability reporting has really uh, had its effect in India out here. So that is the domestic context in India. Let's look at the critical other factor that we spoke about, scoring. I mentioned, I did mention that one of the companies began its journey because it got a poor ESG rating there and it came out of the blue and that's where the journey for ESG began in that particular company. So how do you look at ESG ratings and scorings there? So why should organizations really care about ESG ratings? And we spoke about, you know, why, why this is relevant, how uh, this comes in and why investors really look at credible data sources and how should organizations really care about ESG ratings there? So it really helps the global investors assess the company's ESG performance to take investment decisions. And that's why the credible investment grade data is the uh, focus of this session here. It is important to also look at resilience, anticipation of future risks and opportunities and long-term value creation, which is the essence of sustainability. As a benchmarking tool, it also helps you guide decision-making, improve performance, and highlight the strengths and weaknesses as what for your ESG program out here. And like you said, there are various sources there. Here is a small snapshot of various comparisons. You could use, I mean, this could be some of the ones that you connect with, 
uh, is kind of indicator of, uh, you know, of rating all the rating agencies in some ways to get you an idea of the rating landscape out here. Or the team size, the coverage, the cycle, and how are they paid public? Okay, right. So let's deep dive into a couple of these or three of these to be specific. Uh, the MSCI, that's the Morgan Stanley Capital International. So what does it look at? This rating is focused on what's significant to company's bottom line and is comparable to the peer group out here. Uh, so what is MSCI? It's an investment research firm that provides uh, stock indexes, portfolio risk and performance analytics and governance tools to institutional investors and hedge funds. And how do they operate? It uses a rule-based methodology to identify industrial leaders and laggards. It rates companies on a AAA to the triple C uh, uh, scale according to their exposure to ESG risks and how well they manage this risk relative to the peers there. They also rate companies, uh, countries also on mutual funds and uh, that's how they go here. Uh, so the MSCI ESG ratings, it provides an insight into potentially significant ESG risks, what's upcoming, so that people could make better decisions there. That's viable decisions there. They rate uh, some 8,500 companies, uh, including uh, some 14,000 issuers, including subsidiaries, and uh, have six lakhs or equity and fixed income securities globally. And this is how they collect data, the most relevant publicly available data, and also consider controversies. So talking of controversies, you have a host of them. Uh, you've seen one that's happening that's uh, caught the country by storm. So those are the ones that look at out here. And this percentage weights are assigned to ESG risks according to the time horizon and impacts. And the ratings are calculated, like I said, as a peer comparison out here. So this is how the MSCI really works. And uh, there is an example of what you see on the right, a company and the ESG rating in the category. And it talks about how they qualify them on an ESG rating scale. So that's one insight into MSCI. The other one we'll talk about is Sustain Analytics. Uh, the Morningstar Sustain Analytics covers uh, these many companies there and also looks at the coverage of analyst-based ESG uh, risk ratings out here. It's a building block of ESG rating, looking at corporate governance, material ESG issues, and also idiosyncratic issues, like the one we spoke about, unexpected issues that are unrelated to a specific subsector, but they can cause a storm. And that's the one that comes in uh, like an accounting scandal or otherwise, that's what happens. So these are the ones that look at, and that's how they publish the rating out here. Sustainability uh, has, uh, you know, this is the research team they have across 138 uh, sub-industry classifications. It reviews the potential impact of uh, 20 material issues. Uh, they call it MEIs, ESG issues, M material ESG issues on each of the sub each of the subsidiaries and does an in intensive consultation process. Uh, there are research analysts whose entire job is focused on one particular company. And uh, it issues a report based on an updated annual research. Uh, so there's also various uh, quality and peer reviews that happen. There's assessment of management indicators. And like I spoke about the controversies, it's a multi-sector information. And so sustainability publishes data there. And like I mentioned a long time back, uh, they come in and ask questions and connect with companies. And you can see that the risk levels of three of the companies that we identified uh, exact example here, they're looking at exposure and the risk level, a low and medium risk is what they highlight out here. So this is the way sustain, sustain analytics looks at ESG risk ratings. It's a two-dimensional uh, rating methodology, one on exposure, like we said, and on the management, the set of company commitments, uh, the actions and outcomes that demonstrate how well the company is managing the ESG risk that it's exposed to out here. It's a pretty iterative process that makes it interesting out here. Then there is a Bloomberg. Uh, this is the ESG scores that is also, uh, you know, also has the MSC and other ratings on its terminal so that investor can compare and make decisions. This involves uh, the environmental and social scores, the governance scores, and also the gender equality index. So this looks at all of these and this tracks the entire uh, things together. So all these are designed folks to give investors a data-driven measure of ESG performance. Is any of them the one-stop shop? Maybe not. And that's why the Bloomberg helps you really compare and take this entire, uh, you know, the other kind of uh, flavor, the other, flavor, other platforms also to make your decisions out here. So are these unique? Are they different? So Quisil also said India, SFP global company. Uh, we spoke about that as a context to one of these, uh, the uh, CSA that we spoke about. 
that is the corporate social accountability, the way it is defined. So Chris also across the last three years has been conducting an ESG assessment of uh, the top five to six companies across 53 sectors they done this year. And they look at the Indian or the, the Indian uh, uh, specific nuances, the regulations, the availability of information and the materiality of issues there. So they look at the domestic uh, industries out here and they come up with a platform there. Each of the rating agencies folks has a different uh, number of data points. It could be, even the weightage could be uh, fairly different. The Crystal has 35% uh, on E, 25% on S and 40% on G. So again, each of these would be different. And uh, there is uh, the expectation that uh, you be overall looking at the ESG framework building holistic program to ensure that any company that rates you kind of come fair. So how does this work for listed and unlisted companies? The result does uh, the rating and they look at the ESG score and the final uh, last column looks at the category. Is it adequate or below adequate, strong? And this is how the ranking goes on ESG out here. So this folks is how the rating universe works. And this is how it's important to understand the context. Each of them has different data points, but overall ESG and we could have as many as uh, uh, four figure data points. There some companies, although this as a percentage, it is ESNG, there could be critical 10 or 15 each parameters there. You could have far more there when it looks at actual data that's collected out here. So friends, how does this all work together? How do you put it together? Where does this all lead up to? I, I spoke about uh, when I mentioned in one of the companies that I worked with, there was some key customers who came in and this was in, uh, when I was building up a renewable uh, solar farm across the globe. There was some particularly who wanted all the partners to define, to set it carbon, water, waste, and they wanted to benchmark these versus all other peers there, all other uh, suppliers there. This is where it started. And we projected a net carbon neutrality in a particular way. As it happened, in the first year of reporting, uh, we at Sterling and Wilson Renewables did the uh, baseline, identified the materiality, did our carbon footprinting. And within the first year, went to net neutrality. We, of course, took some support from the CERs that's certified emission reduction certificates. We bought some CES on the market and uh, we did some effort, did some, some good construction work and we were net neutral, one of the first industries to be net carbon neutral in its first year of ESG uh, reporting or baselining there. So that's possible. And that's why it's important to understand that the process of how you do this, how you assess and align, how you engage with stakeholders and assess what is material to the organization. You also look at water and waste or what you look at, like I said, What's material to a renewable company? You look at energy, that's materiality. And therefore, it's important to understand that and align the priorities with the strategies that we do here to measure and calculate, which in the year of the pandemic, when we collected the data, the entire ESG footprint data relating to carbon from a variety of sources across the globe, a global company, across its offices, good, some good learnings there and, indus and using industry standards, the GHG protocol, like we mentioned, to ensure that the data is repeatable and reliable there. How then do you analyze and forecast the roadmap that uh, this company, that customer asks for? How do you project your roadmap? How do you simulate your progress there as would be expanding? What's your net carbon neutrality? How do you use various platforms like the MAC curve, the marginal abatement MAC curve to take in the quick wins to actually go out and you perhaps buy an a CR as we said, and look at other initiatives towards setting up targets. I did look up as a science-based target. In one of the industries we were in, the Tata group, there was a top-down mandate uh, by Rasan Tata himself, who said, we want you to reduce your carbon footprint, water footprint waste 5% year on year. So did we know how to go about it? We didn't, but that was a, a top-down mandate. So how do you analyze? How do you forecast? How do you look at leveraging the product and data metrics? How do you look at doing this? That's the most critical part of putting it together from analyzing and forecasting, being able to visualize what your growth is, what's going to happen, understanding the next the short term could be the next two, three years, the long term could be, you know, don't know what's long term, look at the medium term forecast and see how you grow there. Here. And then you engage and operationalize how you develop a culture, creating an enabling organization. ESG is all about building a culture of ESG, getting sustainable to the DNA, what it takes about, how you communicate success, and of course, a balanced disclosure at what it calls for. And then finally, how you report and disclose on the key programs and ESG performance to internal external stakeholders using the various platforms that we spoke about. 
So these are the various steps. And like we said, in one of the uh, examples we gave, you need digital, you need a set of tools that can support you wherever you go and would want you to understand how you take this up. Uh, requesting I used to explain or demystify some of the tools that could use to help us in this journey of reporting. These five steps we spoke about in reporting of ESG. Uh, I would uh, want you to listen to how this can be done here. Um, thanks a lot, Shankar. And Alicia, can you just confirm if you can uh, see my screen, the presentation? Yeah, we can. Perfect, perfect. Yes, uh, yeah. Maybe we could go back to the earlier screen and speak about some of the platforms to begin with. Yeah. We can do that. Uh, so uh, as, as Shankar briefly mentioned about various steps and the approach that an organization can take, uh, on this slide, we wanted to show you the various processes from an assessing and aligning your materiality to measuring and calculating your data to analyzing and forecasting and engaging and operationalizing. And finally, once you have all of these steps or stages together, you can look at reporting and disclosing. And what you can see on the bottom of each of these stages are the tools uh, that Benchmark offers, which will help you to basically digitalize that process, right? And uh, that, is, that is something that I'm going to talk about next in my next couple of slides. And uh, uh, one, of the, one of the key features that I wanted to just highlight is that no matter where you are in uh, you know, your sustainability journey, we have a tool for you. We, we can actually help you digitalize your, uh, you know, the uh, rest of the sustainability process. Uh, moving on to the slide here. Uh, uh, so this is here, uh, you know, uh, this slide here briefs on the suite of tools and modules we have from a sustainability standpoint. And as Shankar mentioned, we can help an organization to digitalize their process, no matter the stage at which they are. Uh, whether they are at an advanced stage of reporting or are taking baby steps as well. On the right are uh, different tools which will basically help you to digitalize your data capturing processes, your goal setting processes, uh, uh, analyzing your data, credit managing, and many more processes. And together, they completely form the ecosystem for the digital reporting process. We will be more than happy to demonstrate the capabilities of each of these modules. However, given the time that is allotted today, I would be focusing more on the ESG director uh, tool, uh, but please feel free to reach out to us uh, through our website and request for an online demonstration if you are interested to explore more. Uh, the next slide here uh, basically showcases how the data flow happens to the ESG director from multiple sources like sustainability reporting or the operational uh, data capturing tool of Benchmark, which can again be integrated with IT systems or utility uh, data aggregators, apart from the manual data entry option that we have. The data related to trainings or incidents, et cetera, can also be pushed internally from Benchmark's EHS uh, set of modules as well, directly to the ESG director. Or responsible users can also be assigned to feed quantitative and descriptive answers manually. And finally, we can also look at integrating IT systems through a uh, data exchange portal or benchmark directly with ESG director to push or pull the data as well. Once all the data is fed from various sources, we can actually look at reporting it out uh, under global framework and uh, and support your annual uh, integrated or ESG reports. Uh, we can also look at complying to ad hoc requests from investors, uh, you know, stakeholders, consumers, customers, etc., and feed data directly to raters and actors as well. Right. So before the you know before I take you online for a, a short demonstration of ESG director, it's very important to understand various roles and responsibilities who would be involved in navigating through the tool. And there are primarily three responsibilities or three roles. The first one is the ESG administrator, who could uh, typically be the chief sustainability officer or chief financial officer or corporate sustainability team. Uh, the second are program area managers, users uh, who are head of departments, uh, say engineering, operations, environment, etc. 
at a group level and then there are kpi owners who are the end users in facilities ultimately responsible for keying in the data right uh, so uh, to to just summarize it again there are basically three set of people who are involved in the data capturing analyzing and reporting out process in the esg director tool the esg administrator the program area manager who will be the department heads and the kpi owner the people at the field at the front end in your facilities in your entities who will be ultimately keying in the data right so uh, i think with uh, the roles now clear let me take you online and show you how these three roles collaborate together to report out data using the esg data tool so i hope uh, everyone can see my uh, uh, chrome browser right now alicia or shankar can you just confirm Yes, yes, yeah. yeah, sure. Perfect. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is the home page of ESG Director, and on the home page itself, you can see uh, we have mapped uh, around seven hundred odd KPIs coming in from different global frameworks to the system, and we have also categorized them under uh, environmental, social, and governance metrics. Uh, on the home screen again, you can see a set of my uh, you know. tasks which are assigned to me and this is where i can quickly access those tasks as a uh, program area manager or as a kpi owner and i can quickly key in the data that is required from me right so starting from the setting up of the esg director the esg administrator the first tool is responsible for that and he can quickly go and access the system management tool here and this is where he will get multiple options here uh, he can go and quickly manage the users he can deactivate or activate a user he can also assign permissions to these users or assign roles to the individual users as well so he can decide whether say adrian soto he is a program he'll be a program area manager or he'll be a kpi owner or he'll be both so uh, user management is something that esg uh, administrator or the user administrators can manage uh they can also manage the hierarchy of their uh, organization as well using the entity tab here and finally they can manage all the material topics and kpis using the enterprise kpis here so here uh, you can quickly see that uh, you know uh, we have categorized around 414 kpis under environmental 182 under social and 74 under governance which is again coming from multiple global frameworks and we have also grouped these uh, kpis into material topics as well so as a esg administrator the first thing you will have to decide is after your materiality assessment is done that whether that particular material topic is material to you or not and if it is material to you you can keep it as yes if it's not you can key in as no and give a materiality uh, basis for that as well right once you have screened all your topics as material or not you can also go to the top and you know uh, drill down to these kpis based on uh, the global frameworks as well so if i want to see the kpis under gri only i can i can do that as well and now you can see the number of gri specific kpis which are fed into the system right so this is how you can first of all the esg administrator can manage the topics and set up the materialities for each of these topics he can also assign it to program area managers and that is something which has been done here and uh, if you can see the gag emissions uh, material topic is assigned to me right now on this particular page he can uh, uh, define the frequency that he wants to collect the data for that particular material topic and this is again where all the kpis will be also elaborated so you can see all the 84 uh, kpis here under the gag emissions lined up and another thing is if he wants to see the guidelines you know under which global framework it is being reported if i see for uh, say scope and emissions it is clearly showing me that it is a requirement under gri 305 similarly it's a requirement under section 110 of sasp as well as a requirement under indian local uh, you know uh, requirement of brsr under uh, principle 6 so this mapping has been done for all the 700 kpis that we have within the system we have fed into the system and the esg administrator can also at a individual kpi level decide on whether it is applicable for the organization or not 
right? Apart from uh, deciding it at a material topic level as well. So uh, once the K ESG administrator has assigned a particular material topic to the program area manager, if I log in as a program area manager, I can quickly go to assign KPIs. And this is where I'll see that GAG emissions has been assigned to me. And what I as a program area manager have to do next is uh, find out and assign the responsible person from each of the entities for each of these KPIs, right? So if I take an example for the first KPI here, I can quickly go to the entity list. I can see the entire organizational hierarchy that I have. Now, as a program media manager, there might be some of the KPIs which needs to be uh, answered or which needs to be entered with data by the uh, corporate team itself. But there are options of you know uh, collecting data at a business level or at a division level or at an individual site level. So depending on the level of uh, hierarchy that you want to collect the data for the individual uh, KPI, you can do that. If I want it to be collected at say a site level, I can I can just check all these boxes and I can write or I can just key in the uh, you know, respective KPI owners. So this is how I can map the responsible people for each and every KPI that is assigned to me as a material topic. I can also uh, set up the frequency of collection of this data, whether it has to be done on a monthly, quarterly, semi-annual, or an annual basis. And I can also set up our due date, which will be again notified to each of these KPI owners that they have to key in the data before this particular date. So this is how the assignment to the KPI owners happen. And as a KPI owner, once I log into the system, I can quickly go and uh, navigate myself to my KPIs tab here. And this is where I will see all the KPIs which I have been assigned responsible for, right? And once I see the entire list, I can also access and edit each of these KPIs to key in my uh, you know, data as well. So I can key in the response, the basis, and the disclosure statement. I might be also asked to key in some submetrics as well, and I can look at saving this particular KPI. Once I say this, this uh, particular KPI goes through a review and approval mechanism back to the program area manager, where he will review the data, and once he approves it, it will be ready for being reported out. Right. This is this is the manual entry that I am showing you right now. But apart from uh, data being entered manually, as I was saying, there are multiple integration options as well. And let me quickly show you an example here. Okay. So scope on emissions, uh, total scope on emissions. You can see that it's written that uh, it is under the integration with SR. That is the sustainability reporting tool that we have. And if I try to go and edit this particular KPI, I'll see that some of the fields have been already grayed out. And the reason for that is these, uh, this value or this data for this particular KPI is being already pulled in by from the sustainability reporting module automatically. And I won't be able to edit it, right? So this is, this is how an uh, um, integration within the internal tools of benchmark also happens uh, within ESG director. So once I have keyed in all the data as a KPI uh, owner, the status of the particular KPI can be also checked using the track KPI option here. I can uh, check for the status based on the program areas, the material topics, as well as the entities as well, right? So once the data has been keyed in by the data, uh, by the KPI owner, and it has been reviewed and approved by the program area manager, you can now look at reporting and disclosing these uh, KPIs uh, on the public forum. And for that, I can quickly show you some of the reports and dashboards which are already available. Uh, we have a couple of reports. We have uh, reports for all levels of hierarchy in an organization for a person uh, at a KPI owner level or a program area manager level, or say from a C-suite who are not at all engaged in the data entry process, but they want to see the overall dashboard and how the organization is performing in uh, ESMG domain, right? So we have dashboards for that as well. But one of the key dashboards that I quickly wanted to show you here is the disclosures dashboard here. And uh, this particular dashboard will basically help you to screen all your KPIs based on the global frameworks, right? So what you are seeing right here, uh, let me just 
yeah, go full screen here. So these are the individual KPIs and these are the uh, disclosure statements that have been keyed in. And on the left, you can also see the relevance or the mapping with various global frameworks. So if I talk about this one, you can see uh, the GRI and BRR reference to that particular KPI. But say I want to see the KPIs falling under only one of these uh, standards, I can do that as well. Say I select GRI. Now the system will filter out all the KPIs which have been mapped to the GRI standard only. Right. So this is this is uh, very helpful and it will basically help you to create or report out based on an individual uh, uh, global framework as well. So uh, this is this is what I quickly wanted to cover from an ESG director perspective, how, you know, various roles collaborate together to uh, you know, manage your material topics, assigning it to the right responsible people collecting the data and finally reporting it out based on multiple uh, global frameworks like CDP, SASP, uh, BRSR, GRI, et cetera, right? Um, so with that, I quickly hand it over back to Shankar for the key takeaways and the rest of the bit. Shankar, you there? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, great insights. I think you answered most of the questions that's come up in the chat box there. Yeah. So some of the key takeaways, folks, and uh, we see a host of questions coming in in the uh, chat box. Keep going. Some of the key takeaways from this session, folks. Let's uh, recap what we've done. It's not just for this session, but across the last four seasons. What have we learned here? So I guess. We have the audience on the call. The ESG reporting will be mandatory across the APAC, and governments are uh, mandating ESG reporting. And there's going to be uh, overall, there's going to be more and more uh, reporting uh, frameworks, assurance, audits, checks, scrutiny, putting companies and investors' activities under, under the uh, scanner there. Therefore, it's important to have a strong ESG program. Uh, to succeed in the long run. And therefore, it's important to build a strategy as appropriate here. Choosing a framework, and this is what we spoke about today, that's appropriate to the organization needs is critical here. Understanding the rating methodologies uh, also very important because out of the blue, you'll have some agency rating you. You want to know which company it is, what you are. And this is important to understand and be prepared there. And this is how agencies uh, rate, how they rate it's critical for you to understand basis your organization's approach, vision, mission, and the scope, the field you are in. As Ayush so amply identified, digitally transforming an ESG program can ensure sustainable success and collect from collecting across multiple sites and reporting under various frameworks to improving your performance, not just locally, but internationally. Digital transformations can be your best ally out here. So with that, that context, we are on the stroke of uh, well 30. So some question and answers, uh, some of them we are addressed to the chat box. There is Sundar who said, how do you identify, how do you do this? How do you identify the top listed companies? How do you then do it? You know, you can do this on the website here. The link out here, folks, is what you can get. Sundar, you'll be able to identify based on the market cap, which company, and this is as on the end of December 2022, the top market cap, and this is the ranking you need on the top 1,000 listed companies. Uh, also, from the NSE uh, and BC, they published all the BRS are on the website out here. So therefore, you can get from the NSE a snapshot out here from the source. You'll be able to get the data, and you can also get the entire BSE to uh, explain who who are the peers. You could look at the pharma sector or the appropriate sector. You can get the the reports, the business response sustainable reporting. You could download it all in one screen here. So all you need to go, Sundaraju, is to go to the NSE and BSE website out here, right? So product stewardship. I think we covered that in some ways. Uh, there's a question that came in out here from uh, uh, who's that? Yeah, from Aparna. So this overall spoke about the, the E of ESG, the act of minimizing the health, safety, environmental, and social impacts of a product across its entire life cycle. Look at the value chain, look at the life cycle assessment. This is largely what is product stewardship all about. What is net zero? How do you go about reducing the footprint there is the question that's come up by a couple of people. Khushbu Gupta. So this is how we said, we spoke about this in the earlier sessions. You could look at some of the recordings there. You could reduce emissions by doing back calculations, the marginal abatement cap, uh, 
cost curve and see on the x-axis the emissions reduction potential on the y is the cost you could look at what you do the quick wins and therefore you can then make the investments going across time out here so the net zero we've done a couple of sessions there it talks about science-based targets looking at net zero and in a sense it's all about having a plan how you have a science-based target to reduce the emissions getting to the post paris agreement levels of 1.5 degrees here very simply again to summarize for all the audience here, there's a human caused GG emissions, the anthropogenic emissions, and there's the removals there, the carbon sink, like typically you plant a tree, you would balance that, and that's where you get into net zero out here. So this is where the balance comes in, and that's what is uh, the human caused removals, balancing out the humans caused GH emissions, and that's what we need to do to do global warming, a state called net zero emissions there. I hope this helps you understand some of the expectations there. Uh, Zishan, Aparna, I think uh, some of the recordings that you said will be, will be obtained, we'll share the link very soon. Uh, Darren, I think some of the tools to streamline data collection, you all already have a couple of answers in the chat box. Avinash, uh, data collection, I think Ayush uh, has already presented some of the ways. No, you can import it to MS Excel, you can play with all the tools and get what you want out here. Over to Alicia. Have you addressed most of the questions? Have you got more? I think so, yes, uh, Shankar. Thank you so much. Uh, so again, I'd like to thank everybody who attended, as well as Shankar and Ayush for this insightful uh, session. Now, uh, just before we go ahead, I uh, I know some of you said that this is the first part of, that you were attending. Now we're at the end of the series, uh, and many of you have been with us in the journey throughout. So uh, as you know, if you attend all five parts, you can get your ESG Masterclass certificate. But uh, if you've missed out on any of the parts before, uh, we do have YouTube videos of each of the parts. So you can go ahead and scan the QR codes that you can see on the screen. There are QR codes for part one, part two, three, and four. And please go ahead, like each of the uh, videos, and then comment below on what you have learned from the video. If you do this, and, you, and uh, if you watch the sessions as well, now you become eligible for the assessment. The links are also in the chat box. You can also access them from there. Okay, now what you see on your screen here is the QR code for the assessment itself. Uh, now you can go about this two ways. You can take the assessment from here right now by scanning the QR code, or uh, you can go ahead and take it a little later. The link is also in the chat box right now. You can go ahead and watch all the other four parts, other five parts, and then uh, take it if you want to. So um, also my email ID is right there. If you have any questions about the assessment and how you can get the ESG Masterclass certificate, please write to us and we'll uh, help you through it. So yeah. And Shankar, if you could move to the last slide. Yeah. Uh, so again, uh, it's been a great journey having everybody on board through the five parts and uh, in this part, we went ahead and laid the foundation of what your ESG program can look like. And Shankar has been uh, wonderful in helping you through how you can go about the reporting process as well. And Ayush, of course, has been uh, really, has given insightful sessions on how you could use a digital tool, specifically Benchmark's digital tool, to go ahead and report your uh, ESG uh, metrics as well. Now, this is not the end. Uh, we do have... a. Uh, See series two lined up for you. Again, it will be a five-part masterclass, but here we will have industry speakers come in and they will share their stories, their challenges, and how they went ahead and uh, built successful ESG programs. So stay tuned and uh, we're excited to see you soon again. Uh, again, this is not the end of the journey. So, so it's not over. The excitement continues. And once again, the uh, QR code for all of you to actually do it right now. I know you're busy bees, sons of soil, buried under tons of toil, but do please have a scan of the assessment. Try and take it right now. Very simple questions, very simple uh, options there. All you got to do is scan it and take the assessment now to check, take a process check on how well you understood uh, and how good is your EAG portion. Thank you, Alicia, for curating a wonderful series. Thank you, Ayush, for taking us through this entire. Uh, learning journey across the uh, five seasons. It's been wonderful to be on board. Pleasure and privilege and look forward to connecting. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot, Shankar and Alicia, for uh, organizing this. Thank you.